As I'm sure you're well aware by now, I recently took a trip over to New York City, and being a radio nerd, my eyes weren't only drawn to the city's amazing landmarks, but of course every single antenna I passed. If you know, you know. Today, by request, I thought we'd explore AT&T long lines in New York City, so join me as we visit three related sites that formed part of a huge and important network. The AT&T long line system is a network that transformed communications in the United States, but one that is slowly fading from history. After the early wired networks, but before the advent of modern fibre optics, was a system of microwave relay towers transmitting information from coast to coast across the United States. After the Second World War, America needed to connect the large populations of the coasts and around the Great Lakes with the smaller cities in between. These areas were connected by telephone lines as part of the original AT&T long lines network, however the cables of the early voice network weren't suitable for the higher bandwidth needs that were approaching. Wired systems were also expensive to set up and required lots of maintenance. Without the ability to force more bandwidth down the existing cables, and with shortwave radio links suffering from the constraints of ionospheric propagation, AT&T engineers looked further up the spectrum. To microwaves. After a trial in 1944 which saw AT&T build a link between Boston and New York, the company started to plan a coast-to-coast -coast network of microwave relay stations in the C-band from 4 to 8 gigahertz that would not only carry hundreds of simultaneous phone calls but also supply enough bandwidth to carry the growing level of television signals. The long lines network was used to carry television signals such as network television shows and news, as well as important military data. Launched in 1951, the long line stations were connected via line of sight horn antennas, which transmitted or received microwave signals. A call placed in one part of the country would be passed on to the next relay station, then passed on to the next, and so on until it reached the station nearest its destination. The towers were usually spaced around 30 to 40 miles apart. Then it would be sent through cables to the telephone company and finally to your house. During the 1970s, technological breakthroughs spelled the end for the long line system, with two of these new innovations being the development of fibre optics as well as satellites. By the 1990s, long lines was fading into the past. Today, many of the towers are in a state of disrepair or have been taken down entirely, but some survive, redevelop to fit into the most modern urban landscapes. But that's enough of nostalgic imagery, it's time to head over to our first stop, 811 10th Avenue in Manhattan. This is a prime example of a long line site that is surviving well. Also known as the AT&T Switching Centre, this 370 foot tall windowless skyscraper in the Hell's Kitchen neighbourhood, designed by Kahn and Jacobs and completed in 1964, is still owned and operated by AT&T. It's huge too, occupying the full block of 10th Avenue's western side between West 53rd and West 54th Streets. It's designed in a way that it would be able to withstand a nuclear blast and was built by AT&T to house telephone switching equipment. On the roof, and I'm sure you've already noticed, is this beautiful pair of long lines horns complete with an aircraft warning light. The antennas are in remarkably good shape and their enormous weight means they'll likely stay up here as long as possible due to the effort and cost involved in taking them down. Now an AT&T data centre, the hardened facility has amenities like a customer lounge, conference rooms and equipment staging areas. Our next stop is 32 Avenue of the Americas, also known as the AT&T Long Lines Building, AT&T Building or just 32 6th Avenue. This is a beautiful 27 storey, 549 foot tall telecommunications building in the Tribeca neighbourhood of Manhattan. Completed in 1932, it was one of several Art Deco style telecommunications buildings designed by Ralph Thomas Walker. The privately held Rudin Management Company bought the building from AT&T in 1999 and later installed these two magnificent 120 foot tall communications masts on the roof, increasing the building's height from 429 to 549 feet. These came long after long lines, so feature small, unrelated microwave links which are drastically different to their predecessors. 
The building remains in use as a data and communication centre, as well as offering space to various companies and is even home to a theatre. Our last stop on our Long Lines tour of New York City is the infamous 33 Thomas Street, a 550-foot tall, windowless, brutalist skyscraper in Tribeca, Lower Manhattan, and in fact a literal stone throw from 32 Avenue of the Americas. Also formerly known as the AT&T Long Lines Building, it's a long-distance telephone exchange or wire centre building that's still used by AT&T for data processing. It stands out from every other building in New York City due to its architectural style. The site was an integral part of the AT&T Long Lines Department, housing solid-state switching equipment that required tight security and large spaces. It's often described as one of the most secure buildings in America, and it was designed to be self-sufficient with its own gas and water supplies, along with generation capabilities, and protected from nuclear fallout for up to two weeks after a nuclear blast. All three of the sites we've looked at today have evolved considerably as their roles have changed over the years, but their striking architecture, along with those impressive horns over at 10th Avenue, remains virtually unchanged. Buildings like this cost a lot to modify or demolish, so it's fair to say they'll outlive their neighbours by many years, but next time you walk in around New York City, you can be sure you're being guided by the red warning light of the AT&T Long Lines. Thank you.